Hi, you are listening to Rock Lads Radio. A podcast discussing inspiring personalities and interesting things. This is your host Tanmay Shah. Tanmay is an India-based NFT artist and an entrepreneur with diverse business experience. This podcast is self-sponsored. The best way to support this show is to buy his art, NFTs. You can also become his patron. Kindly share this episode on socials and with your friends. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Rocklads Radio. On today's show, we have Mr. Carlo Cecilia. Quote, always keep your connection with humor. You can live long, but without laughter, a long life is not as enjoyable. Mr. Carlo Cecilia is a Venezuelan-born journalist, humor writer, TV host, advertising, and stand-up advisor. He has about 106,000 followers on Twitter and 29,000 followers on Instagram. He is very popular in Latin America and around the world. Um, Mr. Carlos Cecilia was born in 1961. Being just 17 years old, in 1978, he started writing humor scripts for the number one comedy show on Venezuelan TV called Radio Rochella at RCTV. In 1983, he got his journalist degree from UCAB College in Caracas, Venezuela. He also started writing and drawing Chopa, a cartoon comic strip, and then in 1989, and on the same TV network, he started hosting a David Letterman-like TV comedy talk show in Spanish called Cala, Calate Cecilia, that means Shut Up Cecilia, <laughs> okay, and was on the air for about three years with a great comeback in 2000. He's currently doing a creative bilingual consulting from Venezuelan and international advertising companies. And he's also an online humor advisor for stand-up comedians locally and abroad. Currently, he is co-hosting two Twitter spaces every week, one in Spanish and the second in English. Welcome to the show, Mr. Carlos. It's so great to have you. I'm so honored and a bit nervous to be hosting you today. Thank you, thank you, Tan Mai. Listen, what? What? Uh, I will. I wanted to ask you first a question. I know it. It should be the other way around, of course, because this is your show. <laughs> you're interviewing me, but I'm gonna start this interview by interviewing you about something very important for me. Well, I could Google that, but I prefer your answer. What, who is the best comedian or comedian in India right now? Uh, is there, is there, I mean, is there comedy? Because you have a lot of production in cinema. I mean, the Bollywood is produces, which is like eight times the amount of, of movies that Hollywood produces in California. And I do love, I want to, I want to tell you and all the Indian listeners that get close here, Hello, it's Mark. Hello, it's Mark. Thanks for coming. And I'm Gypsy. Uh, I do love the movie Three Idiots uh, from India. It's wonderful. It's heartfelt. It's your, uh, I mean, it's such a mix of humor and human qualities. It's, it, it has so many messages. I And there is a trick for mental health in that movie that I think that movie should be of mandatory viewing uh, all over the world because the part when they sing this this song of all is well all is well and, and he's patting over his heart in his chest for calming down when you have big trouble and let me tell you man that made that sing really, really functions. I have been during this last two years of pandemic, I will have been probably jumping off a bridge or something. And I remember then the three idiots movie trick 
and I start singing and, and patting my chest and patting my heart. Hey, 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 just like he's my pet or my dog or my cat. Hey, all is well, all is well, all is well, all is well. And it, it, and the, my heart believes it. And I get calmed down and I tranquilize myself. And it's, it's just like a wonderful, I mean, I'm so grateful to that movie. Yes, so, it is an amazing movie. I'll just play the song for the listeners, just the one line. Ah, you have a movie over there. Okay. Yes, it's an amazing movie. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, all is yeah, well, yeah. don't worry. And uh, we are going to have a lot of fun today. So, comedian, you asked me from India. A very, exactly. by far, the very popular uh, comedian in India is Kapil Sharma. He does his night talk shows. Uh, I will send the link of his to him, to you. Some olden comedians are uh, Johnny Liver. Uh, then there is Shekhar Suman and there is uh, a politician who is uh, called known as Siddhu. So there are many people, many comedians. I will share my friends who are showing hearts right now here. They will also have many recommendations. I will forward those to you. And yes, our industry, film industry in India is the largest industry in the world, not just Bollywood. We have 21 official languages. So there are movies in all those languages. There is uh, Hollywood, Tollywood. I mean, <laughs> there are different languages, uh, production in different languages. So we produce around 1,000 movies every year in different genres. This was statistic of five years ago. Let me see what is it now. But yes, we produce a lot of movies and we everyone enjoys a lot of entertainment. <laughs> okay, so, okay. And and in this case, uh, well, let, let's do something. Maybe you can put a person on the... I mean, uh, there is any link or, or uh, just do that. Uh, just do this, I'm going to ask you. Please write down the names of the first comedian or the first two or three and just put them in a tweet and just then you put the tweet on the nest. So yes, I will do that make, right make, now. Make it right now. Good idea. And I will start talking about my beginnings just like a self-presentation. Uh, I know you already read part of my biography and I do appreciate that a lot. But I want to tell you that uh, the people listening to me now I am a 60 years old, 60 year old person, but I started, I, I was so lucky and privileged to work in television very, very early. I was working as a, a script writer, comedy writer for a Venezuelan TV show, uh, which is like Saturday Night Live here in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, that show doesn't exist anymore but it was the most important humor and comedy show. And it was just 17 years old when I started. So I want to ask you, can you imagine a, a kid like me just out of high school? I had been watching during all my infants uh, when, when, when I was a little kid. I was raised watching these geniuses on the Radio Rochella program. And then... Suddenly, I did a jump and, and I entered uh, to the show and I was belonging to the show. And I, I was writing a script for these comedians, uh, uh, which the, the ones I would grew up with. So it was really, really a, a, a great occasion for me to learn. It was, uh, I was with another uh, companion who was as young as me. We were studying journalism at the university together and we were kind of just like the pets of the program because the show was uh, with a lot of old people older people and and it was like a, a we were just too young for the task but we survived we did survive so the first thing i want to tell you uh is the secret for making uh, any kind of humor product if you, if you need a, a joke for a presentation that you're going to make, uh, for example, in your, in your business, in your, in, your, uh, in your work, there is something that you can do. 
always remember, you need a good pre concept about what you're going to tell. You have to lead to, you have two or three little jokes along that concept. And then you need a great punchline, a very good punchline. Sometimes you have to think in the punchline first. Okay. For example, if your boss is going to be present and it's like a small lecture or conference. So you have to prepare something that has, it's just like a, for example, the other day I started uh, one of these interviews, the, you know, when you test the microphone and it went like, a, okay, one, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, the woman interviewing me told me, oh, I can hear you. Okay. And I said to her, okay, Indra, listen. Uh, there is an old custom in Venezuelan radios and TV. Uh, we test the microphones counting one to 100. So I'm going to start right now. One, two, three. And she started to scream like, a, hey, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. She's like, we cannot wait till you count to 100. And I said to her, oh, you are scared because, you know, I'm very capable of counting to that. So we had just like a, a funny, a funny start. And, and you know, uh, it's very, it's very easy. Uh, it's very important, sorry, to ease the atmosphere the most you can. When, th when things are too stiff, you know, and people is too formal and people is too serious, you need to loosen things up a little bit with uh, some humor because the excess of formality uh, in, 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 in invites the, the communication. You know what I mean? So if you are with a person, okay, he may be the president of the company, but he's also a human being, okay? So you need to, to treat everybody just like, a, a, like normal. And, and, and when you are in, the, in front of a microphone or something, you just have to be going and talk like you are talking to uh, uh, one, only one person, okay? So that's one of the tricks of the trade that we have learned uh, working in this, in this, in this business, in the, in this industry. Okay, oh. so, sir, I had asked this question to you earlier, and you had given an amazing answer. So let me ask you again: How to convert a stressful situation like that of anxiety, depression, jealousy, or anger, or so on and so forth? into joke and how to laugh at it loudly instead of having headaches or heartburns and heart pounding uh, due to it. How to make life, uh, how to find humor in life in stressful situation. Okay. The first thing that you can do is, uh, th there is a secret of life, which is actually I mean, everybody talks about that, but you have to make an effort, an actual effort uh, to, to do it. No, she is a friend of mine. She was going to send me, this is like Morphe's law. Okay, uh, if I understood your question well, you were asking me how to do when you feel bad and you feel sad or anxious and how to, how to get to feel better. Or to, or to feel good, or to feel even uh, hilarious or humorous? That's yes. your question? Yes, in life we have many situations where we feel very anxious or very depressed, unhappy, um, worry about the future or uh, regret about the past. And sometimes it becomes very difficult. So in this situation, how do you find humor in this and la laugh at it? Well, usually humor is in the truth of things. Okay, for example, I'm gonna put, I'm, I'm gonna explain this with uh, with uh, a, a, a simple example. I was when I was a kid. We went to a house visiting that house, that family, and they have a very very old grandmother, great uh, grandmother. Sorry who did use to play piano when she was younger. She was now something like 97 years old, very, very shaky and very, very old. 
And then the people from that house, that family told us that the lady was going to play piano for us. It was one of the surprises they had. So it was really a surprise because when we saw the woman approaching the piano, she was barely, she, she didn't have a cane or anything. She was helped uh, by his son and she sat down at the piano. She sat down at the piano and when she saw the keyboard of the, 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 the keyboard, the keys of the piano, she started playing like magic. And everyone was mesmerized, okay? And it was wonderful. But then disaster arrived. Do you know what was disaster? She never stopped playing. First, we were wondering, just like, oh, will this woman will be able to play? I mean, she looks like she's going to die in, in 15 minutes. I mean, she really looked old and without a strain. And then life came from inside her and she started playing one song and then another 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 another one and she was singing venezuelan music international music and then and she said well i'm going to make you happy now with my rendition my piano rendition of new york new york by frank sinatra and she started at the piano ping 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 but that was the song number 20 and then she went to number 22 and number and she didn't stop playing and suddenly at the end of the song number 27 when we were almost desperate, everybody was in a silent hell, a little kid besides his mother. Suddenly, you know, in this moment, socially, when the silence come, come down because she stopped playing the piano, the applause did finish and, and, and everything was silent. And then the little kid asked his mother, mom, mom, will this be the last one? Will this song be the last one? He just asked it. What well, everybody was asking inside their heads. And that brought the house down. And there was so much laughter, thanks to the question of the kid, that she understood that she was abusing of our time and she was excessively playing. And I learned two lessons. You must never be too long doing things like this answer I'm giving you. <laughs> and second, if you tell the truth, you suddenly become a humorist or a comedian because a comedian, what a, what a comedian actually does is to say what everybody is watching with the eyes, but nobody dares to say with the tongue or speak with your mouth. You know, if there is a very, 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 very fat person in the party, Oh, everybody says, oh, my goodness, this man may weigh like 400 kilos and nobody says anything. OK, I was with a comedian friend once in a in a in a wedding and there was a, a guest who was the size of a building, very, very big. And then when the when the food and that very fast because the wedding was for a family which was not very monetarily strong. It was, they were not poor, but they were did a very strong effort to make the wedding. And the, the food ended too soon. And then the comedian said, hey, listen, if you don't bring here little sandwiches soon, we start eating him. And he pointed to the fat guy. And he said that we were going to eat him alive or like we were cannibals or something. It was the obvious choice. He was the big, I mean, he had meat for all of us here. Everybody was laughing because he said the truth. And he pointed what everybody was just like, a, oh, now is a much difficult time for humor because we have this political correctness going around in circles and everything that you used to joke. I mean, <clears throat> you have a friend, for example, in Venezuela, the word for black is negro. And uh, in some context, 
if you are with a friend of you or he's a family of you, and you go like, hey, come on, Negro, man. come here. It's, like a, it's not an insult. I mean, you're using the color for referring to him, but it's just like a custom. If a person is too, too short, you just go and you, you can talk uh, and, and, and say, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to do with jokes about that. It, it was a custom for centuries, okay? And if you are not doing it with a bad intention of an, of an intention of hurting people, oh, come on, what's wrong with that? And especially if the victim, quote, if the victim is, is, is happy with it and don't have any trouble with it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, okay. so when I had asked this question to you when we first became uh, friends in November, you had given an awesome reply that I al always think to myself. You had given three tips. One is to imagine as if it is happening to others and not happening to you. <laughs> second is yeah. ask, second is ask what what will you think of this in next five years? If you know that you won't ever remember it, laugh at once. Third tip was remember you will be dead forever. <laughs> you will uh, concede to any pity nuance the power to spoil of your remaining days. So just be happy. <laughs> the, those those are the three tips you had <laughs> given, and the fourth and fifth one today is an addition to them. <laughs> Thank you for that. I do have a friend who have, a, and I do recommend you to have a friend who has a helicopter, and my friend lends me the helicopter. So if a, a, a people is making me miserable or I am depressed because the things of this person is telling me, I just take this person, put him inside the helicopter, I go to the Mar Caribbean Sea in front, and I left this person abandoned in one island in the Caribbean, and I go back, and he won't bother me again. That's the easy. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm making everything up. <laughs> I don't have any friend with a helicopter. Forget about it. Hello, Khalid. I didn't see you before. I was having some technical trouble. No, I'm going to answer you seriously, uh, your question, if I can. Because, listen, think of humor as the lubricant of the engine of life. His life is an engine, okay? An engine can go, hello, Khalid. If, if, you, if, you, if life is an engine, okay, imagine an engine in an automobile, in a vehicle. It has a lot of what? Of friction. There is a lot of friction going around inside an engine. Isn't it right, Tanmay? I want to listen. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm just checking your audio. <laughs> That's why I asked you. <laughs> okay, so, but this is true, and this is serious. This is serious what I'm talking. So, what's the problem with friction? The problem with friction is that the excess of friction becomes a trouble because it gets warmer and warmer and then it's real heat. And this is just like you, are, you cannot stand the heat. And then pieces inside the machine can even start to melt down and the actual engine can broke as a result of the friction. Okay? So life is exactly the same. What do we do in an automobile or in a vehicle to stop the troubles caused by friction? We use lubricants. Lubricants. We, we use lube oil and we put oil in the engine. That's the reason engine oil, of the motor oil, to avoid that the motor gets wrong start malfunctioning or can break and became totally useless. That's what happened in lives, in life. So I'm going to repeat to the for Daniel who just came in. Humor is just like the lubricant of the engine of life. If, if you can think of your life like an engine, you have moments in your life when you are resting. Oh, okay, that's when your automobile 
is in your house and is stopped, is you park it in front of your house. Okay, the 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 motor engine doesn't have any trouble at all. But maybe that you have a hectic Saturday, family Saturday. Oh, your wife wants you to go to pick up some things because you have a birthday party the next day. Oh my goodness, how many errands are you our course you have to do for the freaking birthday tomorrow? Oh, ah, let's buy the let's bring the cake. Let's uh, good for the look for this. We had to purchase the gift. Okay. What happens to the engine of the of the vehicle that day? If you have all that friction and you don't have enough oil, you're dead. So what you have to do is to look at yourself like an oil can that can spoil and spill, sorry, spill your oil of happiness over the other people. Okay? Just a word here, just a phrase, just a comment. Okay, for example, uh, like, uh, I, 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 I did enjoy some so how so uh, it was so brilliant. I was in a, you know, the situation in Venezuela is pretty difficult right now uh, for the yes. majority. I have, we, for the listeners who are not aware, I'm just saying from my knowledge that the political, it's very unstable in Venezuela. You have Venezuela has got the largest oil reserves, yet there is trouble for food, for people to get food on the table. So yeah, that was one of my questions coming soon. So how do you deal with the political situations, or how do you uh, find laughter in this uh, critical situation? Well, first it has to. It, 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 let me tell you something very sad. That is because. Uh, the actual political situation of the last 15 years had changed our streets, our atmosphere. I mean, people in the streets, Venezuelans are not as happy as before. I mean, we try to cope the, the best we can, but with these strong uh, economical difficulties, it's really, really hard for a, a more and more people. But anyway, we keep going and we are still happy people. We are still, I mean, capable of laughter and capable capable of joking and uh, keep going forward, okay? What do we do? I think that uh, we like to joke on each other a lot. Uh, one comedian, one fellow professional comedian, one of the biggest in Venezuela, called Emilio Lovera, he says that it's very difficult to be a comedian in Venezuela because everybody, when goes to a show, when, when, when a Venezuelan goes to see a stand-up comedy show, everyone that is sitting in the audience thinks that he's funnier than the comedian. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> and imagine going to see a, a, a Pavarotti and, or Placido Domingo and you believing, actually believing that you sing better than Placido Domingo. I mean, that can, well, that's the reality of the Venezuelan psychology. I mean, we as comedians, we as performers, we feel that. So in the world of comedy, you have the hecklers, and you know that the hecklers can sabotage your act and can just like sabotage your jokes and make you fail, whatever. Well. They're dangerous. The most dangerous hecklers in the world are here because the people is like, a, oh, man, I will make it so hard for you to make me laugh. So comedians here in Venezuela are like real rock. I mean, I real stars. I real is in, in an athletic sense. They will be all gold medal winners because the, the public and the audience here and maybe they keep quiet, but you know that the inside they are thinking just like, uh, I still can do better than you. I still can do better than you. So I what mean, do they you do in situations like this? Can you repeat? What do you do in this situation? No, usually, well, some some of comedians have, uh, sometimes they go, they go to a, a, a trick that is just like a people who usually interrupts a show 
is that they are calling for attention. They need for attention. They need attention, and they they are what what the American culture, uh, you know, you like attention. Uh, uh, they have a, a strong word, and I don't I don't want to use it here uh, in case there are minors listening. But you know <laughs> what I mean. You know, attention double H is the word, and uh, <laughs> and the people that who desperately need to be. Uh, receiving attention so some comedians invite them to the stage friendly in a very peaceful and friendly way and they say hey come on uh, go, come on here let's talk a little bit let's talk about your job and and they pretend to make uh, uh, for a while a little interview like normal and then suddenly they joke with him they make him feel comfortable he doesn't bully him or 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 make fun out of him just like a just like a um, being satirical or distasteful and then this person goes back to the public between applause and oh yes his ego is now happy oh the com- i stopped the show of the comedian i did it and then after doing that everybody knows that they commit a great mistake but now the public loves the comedian for being so patient and hate the stupid one who did cause the interruption and cause the comedian to miss the reason of his show. You know what I mean? Oh. Yes, I totally so, get it. And it is so different over there <laughs> because startup scene in India is growing. There are a lot of... I have personally been to a couple of startup live shows and uh, the person on stage makes fun of the people who are sitting in the first row and nobody wants to see in the sit in the first row and this kind of thing happens and everyone is taking it fun and lightly this is situation is in india but as you described venezuela like people want to have a lot of attention they need a lot of attention and think they are funnier than the host and what example you gave and how the person responds to it i can uh, points which I can extract from that is uh, give people what they are seeking. <laughs> if they want, if they if they want a lot of attention, call them up, give them what they want, and then let them go back. Uh, is that what you are uh, referring yes, to? Yes, exactly that. Exactly that. Sometimes because if they are bothering, you know, and bothering and bothering and bothering and bothering, you have two chances. One is to become like a dictator of your show and call for the security people and hey, please security okay take him out and that's not uh, agreeable i mean it, that that spoils your atmosphere you know what i mean so it's better to expose the in the person who is interrupting uh, and to expose him because he he will be in the stage it's just like a, you know what it, let me tell you this is interesting they did something great in Spain like 10 years ago because you know that people is watching a soccer game and the people, it's like, you're, you're crazy, totally crazy in, in India with cricket, right? Cricket is like the national sport, isn't it? It is not the national. National sport is hockey, but cricket is the most popular like football in the West. Okay, exactly. Well, I know that cricket, imagine that people... I, I guess that in, in the cricket tribune, so when people go to a cricket stadium or or to st- this uh, uh, stairs to to see the to to see the game, everybody is a specialist in cricket. Okay, so if the player did a mistake, they go, "Why you didn't do? Why you didn't move it like that? Oh, you should do this. You should do this." Okay, in Spain, you know what they did? They uh, a television program which was a wonderful show. I don't recall the exact name. They got into the tribune, and it was just like a giant candid camera skit. Listen what they did. This per they choose one person on the tribune that was screaming against the player. It was a Barcelona game with Lionel Messi. Okay, and Messi was playing along with this. Okay, so I, I believe that this may be in YouTube. And it, they, they got this person who didn't know anything about the giant trap they were setting around him. He was, Messi did, uh, there was a fault 
against uh, I mean uh, uh, against the goalie. He he has to shoot, and the ball when it didn't was a goal, it was out. So he started screaming and criticizing Messi because he did fall at the penalty at the penalty shoot, and so just like uh, these people from uh, a Badlands come to take a crazy person away and put a, a you know a tight a tight uh, shirt around they grabbed the guy they took him down to the field and they took him in front of the of the where the, where the goalie is and he they put the ball and they said okay do you know how to shoot a penalty okay you do it you are in live television right now for 30 million people of Spanish viewers, okay? So go ahead and, 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 and make the goal by yourself. He didn't want to do it. It's so funny. You see the reaction. You're like, no, no, no. Hey, but yeah, we have you recorded here. And you know what the television program did? They put the recording of all the insults and all the explanations that technically he knew how to shoot perfectly that goal, you know? And he said, but listen, here we have, we have you here. Listen to yourself. And he said, no, 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 but he, this is not the same. It's not the same being here. Okay, we got ya. That's what we wanted to hear. Okay. See, see, it's not the same from up there than being here playing, being tired, being hard with being with injuries. I mean, so it was a big lesson for everyone. And of course, he didn't. Uh, they, he didn't. He he didn't get him to. He didn't even try the shoot because he knew that the goalie was actually good. That he was. He didn't have any practice. I mean, he was going to be in total ridicule. Okay, so he avoided it. He said, "No, I'm not gonna even try. We're gonna give you uh, like half million dollars." In, no, I don't accept it. I don't want it. I won't do it. And this person didn't do it. And that's yeah. the life. That, yeah, I can was, understand this. It even happens in cricket. People are like, uh, they should have hit like that. And I think it happens in all the sports. Now, sometimes yeah, I was wondering. Yeah. I like to play sports more than to see, to view them. So I always wonder what do people, why are so people fascinated about the shows and what are they always gossiping about these things? So um, then I started realizing that they it, they form a community and um, it's just like uh, philosopher, philosophers countering each other's arguments in olden time on some philosophical or progressive things. They form clubs or in their groups of friends, they talk about this should have strategies and which player should go to which club and what have, what should have been the game plan. So I think that comes from there. <laughs> but um, the incident which you shared about bringing the person, if they think they are too smart, then just talking, they getting them on the stage and putting a spotlight and that gives a message really <laughs> strong. So yes, thank you for that. Uh, I would lead you to another question, sir. You have been a TV talk show host for so many years. So what are the tips as a host would you like to share with us and for me as I'm being a as I'm starting to be a host uh, of podcast? Okay, I will give you something that usually I charge for it because I am an advisor and consultant. So I'm going to give you my free advice here because that will be a good advertisement for me. So probably some people will want to go to my bio and check my connections and, and or, or DM me and telling me that they want my, my they want to hire me. Listen, the first important thing, the, the first and biggest secret is this in, in a, for being a host. The secret question by Larry King. Do you remember Larry King from CNN? the great host of CNN during more than 20 years, almost 30 years. Well, he said in his book that the best question for a host when you're an interviewer is the question, why? And why is why the best question? Uh, it seems like a pun, but it's not pun intended. Why is the word why or the question why the, the, the best one? Because it forces you to an elaborate question. 
It hasn't happened to you with your previous guests, any of your previous guests, that you elaborate a long question and you say, oh, dear Carlos, blah, 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 and you say, you mother frigging, I mean, I, I made a question like through three paragraphs long and you're going to answer me with a single yes. I mean, are you out of your mind? I, you want to kill the guest. You want to kill it with your own hands. So if you, but if you ask a question that includes a why, the why you cannot even, unless you want to lose like a kid, just like very immature or uneducated, you cannot say just like to imagine you had the president Obama or President Trump or President Macron in France, and you said a question just like a President Macron, uh, why you did took that measure economic measure? Why? And he said because yes. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine a president responding like that? Because yes, like a little brat, a little kid. He would no. He has to explain the after a why. You have to say because. And then you have to invent an explanation if you don't have one. Or you have to say the explanation you usually applies if someone's, uh, someone makes you that question. Isn't it? So that's the first trick. You have to have, when you're going to make an interview, get your hand, I mean, get a pen, get a marker, and write the, uh, the word why in your hand, in the palm of your hand, especially if you are not in a Zoom interview or in a television interview because that will remind you to use why because sometimes the best question is not the next long question you are going to make me the best question is ask interrupting me now and and ask me asking me for example carlos and why do you see that question works why okay that will be wonderful it's like oh okay so i have to elaborate i have to answer Okay, so yes. that's the first rule. That's the most brilliant piece. That's if I can give you only one advice on how to be a good host and a good interviewer is this one: use the question "why." Okay, so Carlos, why did you become a talk show host? <laughs> okay, that's perfect. I. I there, there is that's a wonderful thing and please jot down are you jotting things down because I am not using anything here I'm, I, I, I I love your feeling uh your your spirit and you know and I, I will tell you this this is really this should be your sound really flattering to you but it is true it's not flattering it's not a false or arbitrary flattering according to the people uh I have to talk to, or if I am in an interview, if I had a strong feeling, a strong bonding, like just like a nice frequency, or I can feel that the other person is just like a nice person and stuff, you know what? What's the signal of that I am perceiving you like in, a, in the same frequency or as a in a friendly f- frequency? It's because I am not taking notes or preparing uh, answers, or you know what I mean. And I today in this in this interview we're making I'm totally I mean I don't have anything to write, see, so that's a good signal because I like the way you tweet I like the way you treat your followers your answers I like the what you what you, what you put in your bio is one of the best bio intros I saw. What's a pizza with some cheese? What's the stars with the star, the sky with the stars? What's your collection with our Tanne piece? I mean, that's wonderful. I did love that. So I feel at ease here with you. I, I know that you, I feel that you have a big heart and you are a nice, really nice person and happy person. So I don't have, I am not afraid of nothing. I think this, I, I, I know, I don't feel ob- that obviously this interview is not a trap. It's not a pro, it's not going to cause me trouble. It's not going to, I, I mean, I feel at ease. I feel at home. I feel like we have been friends for 20 years. So that's the first thing. So going to the question, why I became a talk show host. Listen to this. It's very easy. I started as a humor writer in a, program in a show 
that had a different is, is a different genre from the usual talk show host like uh, Jimmy Fallon today or or David Letterman in the past. Okay, so what I what I uh, is, uh, did was the following thinking in my life. I was very young, and he said, "What do I want for my life? I do I want to be." Uh, 30 years writing comedy in the same program or I want to be doing something extra. And I noticed and I discovered thanks to a friend bring me, bring me in, he was bringing me tapes from the States, from the United States with Letterman programs. And I started watching Letterman in the VHS old tape recorder, uh, uh, video tape recorder. And I said, wow, what is this guy doing? I mean, at first, it was even difficult for me to understand his kind of humor. But it's, I, then I start to adore him, to adore his concept. And then I said to myself, my goodness, we don't have this kind of show in Venezuela. Why don't we create one show in this style? Because this is totally different to the program where I had been a writer for during 11 years. And I was like 27, 26 years old only. and then. I decided to work for that. But listen to this. I didn't want to be the host. You know that, you know, Saturday Night Live in the United States, it's, it started in 1975 and it's still going strong. So, well, when up, ups and down, it's like a roller coaster. Uh, Saturday Night Live has great moments and very, very down moments. I don't know which moment is now. Uh, but the, Lorne, the producer, the general producer is Lorne Michaels. Lorne Michaels have, has been the head of Saturday Night Live all these years. And so he doesn't appear in the sketches. He's not the guest. He's not the host, sorry. He's not the main character, but he's the mastermind behind the whole program. So my original idea was... I want to create a Letterman style show for Venezuela, but I don't want to be Letterman. I don't want this to be sitting in the desk. I want to be the general producer. I want to be the Lord Michaels of this idea. So I started to do casting and I started to do casting and continue to do casting. And I was receiving a lot of candidates, but they didn't understand, they didn't know Letterman because there was, in that time, I'm talking to you, this was in year 1987, imagine. You know, it's, it's like uh, uh, 43 years ago that we are talking about. 43 years, almost half a century. So it was difficult to make these people to understand the concept. So one old cameraman who had been working with our Venezuelan Ed Sullivan, who already was dead, but he, this cameraman has been working with this great Renny Otolina. He was the number one, the absolute number one in our television. He was like Ed Sullivan in the United States. And he told me, listen, why you don't sit there and do it you? Do, do it yourself. I mean, do the show. You are the one who understands the, the Letterman concept, this thing you want to bring here. Why don't you do it? And I explained to him, I know, because I don't want, I, I, I want to keep anonymous. I mean, I don't want to, I, I got a, a real, a, a very good friend and he entered into the show I, I write for and, and he became famous. And I saw how his life changed. I mean, he went to a bakery, a store or whatever, whatever. He went in here, moving in Caracas. People were asking autographs and stuff, you know, and he was popular and he loved that a lot. It's not that I don't love it now that I became popular for a while. Now, thank God, a lot of time has have been, uh, the last 15 years, I have not been in the mainstream media. So the new generation doesn't know me so much. I have uh, plenty of followers in the, people who stop me in the, in the street, it's just like uh, people like 60 years old like me, 50 years old, maybe older. And they, oh, Carlos, oh, I, we remember. And, and we start, you know, just a nostalgic trip to the past. But what I, what I mean is that I didn't want to become popular in that moment. But finally, I understood that if I wanted that program to exist, 
I will have to do the sacrifice of sitting there. And I think that this sounds like unbelievable for a lot of people. You're like, uh, hey, come on, how, how are you going to call a sacrifice to be sitting, to have your own show in the number one TV station of a country, in this case, RCTV of Venezuela, in that moment, we were total number one. And, and how can you call that a sacrifice? Well, because in my personal view, I didn't saw myself as a host because I was a writer. I was a writer producer in my mind. So I had to change my frame of mind to accept myself and, and talk to myself and convince myself, okay, Carlos, you can do this. Let's, let's sit here and let's do that. I had done, uh, no, no, I even had done any radio. I, I never had been talking in public. I mean, I, I was just like, a, it was going to be the first time. So finally, I sit down, I did some tests, and I told the station, hey, listen, uh, do you mind if I do the show and I, and I am the host? Because look at this test. They saw the candidates, they saw the tapes, and they said, no, 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 this is terrible. This is terrible. It's better than you do it. And that was the reason I ended up sitting in the Jimmy Fallon's desk, in the David Letterman desk. Then I got to like it, okay? But that was the real origin of the, of the, of the thing. And then I started to learn how to interview people. And then I was just like mimicking what Letterman was doing. And then I, I finally got uh, the handle of it and the show skyrocketed, thank God. And, and we will spend like uh, three or almost four years with very, very good ratings. And, and it was a very good time. Uh, but I wanted to answer you so uh, and give you two more tips about public speaking, okay, that are very important, especially if you are a host. The second tip is that you have to listen a lot. Try to do an effort to really, really, really you may maybe you have prepared seven wonderful questions, okay? But please, if you did, if you after you said the second question, are your and your guest is answering it, forget about you have five more questions to make, and he, and listen to the guest, listen always to the guest. So that's the best thing because in that way you can uh, let him the freedom to express himself and get to know him to truly know him okay and the other thing besides being present but why why you have to become present and listen to him very very eagerly because listening to him you will become with better questions than the one you have in your paper because something that the guest that happens 99% of the time, okay? Maybe you, you know what I'm talking about because probably you had your questions prepared and sometimes, many times, your guest surprised you with something that he said and creates in your mind a new and wonderful and powerful question, okay? So that's the second thing. And the third one is try to interrupt a lot. In the good sense, I mean, uh, in this case, that will be that will be meaning that I'm telling you indirectly that you are, you are doing it wrong. And I don't want to say that because I don't know your style. Maybe you prefer to keep quiet and to listen a lot. But there is active li there is active listening. You know what I mean? You can still be a listener even when you are interrupting. What, how how are you gonna achieve that? If you, inter if you interrupt me to reinforce what I'm telling, you know what I mean? Yes. Like going, uh, I, I mean, yes. you should have your microphone open and it's very helpful for your guests and even for the audience. And I do rec seriously recommend you to do that. Let, leave, let, let that the only mi mics open are yours and the guest one. And then while I'm talking, you go like, a, yes, mm-hmm. Okay. And suddenly you can say, no, no, no. Oh, for example, you have soccer, but we have cricket. Exactly, I say, and I keep going. And then a little bit more forward, you interrupt me again. You, it's just like you're talking with a friend. You know what I mean? If you have a friend in your house, 
taking some beers or something, and you're talking about something, you don't ask a question to your friend and leave him talk only by himself alone. And you can you should your mouth should you you just Absolutely. go. I agree with you, you know? what you said. And to reinstate what you said, first ask always have why question. Second is to drop all the list of questions and just actively listen to the guest speaker. And third is to interrupt. <laughs> Interrupting is something I need to learn more tactfully. Yes, I'll keep my mic on uh, in the coming episodes. <laughs> no, but you know, I, I, I'm going to teach you right now and our listeners the best interruption that that you can use. If the if, if your guest is saying, uh, talking affirmatively about something or saying yes, for example, if I say, because soccer is the best sport in the world, you just say, yes, yes, I do agree, yes. I mean, a yes is the most easiest and uh, unbothering interruption you, you can make. And with, with, if your guest listens that you're interrupting him not to oppose, not to oppose him, or, or to be in opposition to his views, but to follow his direction. He will feel eager uh, about your next interruption. He will, he we will want you to interrupt again. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you have to become like uh, very uh, easygoing or or be a uh, uh, people just like. Uh, uh, too com complacent is a word. I don't know if that word exists yes. in English. Complacent, complacent. Yeah, just like a, no. It's, it's not. You're not or, or or an ass kisser. Just like a, you know what I mean. It's, it's like a, no, no, no. You just you just is is just sharing the the time of a normal conversation because I do a separation between among interview and conversation. You can have a, an interview and then in the interview. You tend to put the person just like over a pedestal, you know, uh, a pedestal, you know, just like a small statue. It's like, oh, here I have this big person, such and such. If you treat him like he's in a, a, a little statue, he will behave like that. He will become formal, like a statue is, you know. Uh, oh, this is like a. Yeah, yeah, but if you go interrupting him, just like, okay, you are important. What you're saying is important. But it's not as important as not to interrupt you. So you can go and 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 enter and here and there you can say and and, and for example if if I am giving two examples of fruits you can say oh of, or or the, also the pineapple too and I will say as a guest oh yeah exactly the pineapple is also a perfect example you know what what I mean if a, yeah. if, if your guest is is giving examples think fast. And add an, an, another example in the same direction he's going. Being politics or sports or medicine, no matter the subject you're talking, you just go for an example in the same direction that your guest is speaking. Yes, sir. Sir, um, I totally thank you for the points. I want to lead to another question that you uh, wanted to talk about, that is adoption of past radio and television industries into current social media and especially the Twitter spaces. So why do you think that is important and what can we grasp from that? Okay, because I think that the old radio era, the golden radio, radio era in the United States and the golden era of television, they did learn enough and a lot about humans, about human beings, right? And they fine tune the how to control the interest of people, how to try to manipulate their attention or their brains, even their brains, and how to get this advertising campaign to function better than the other and this program to have more rating than the other. So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of items, elements in the structure of all radio and our television that per perfectly should be applied or could be applied in Twitter spaces. Number one, the duration of the spaces, okay? That doesn't have to be a mystery. You know what I mean? For example, you in the United States, you still have on the air a program 
which is called 60 minutes. What does that tell you, Dan May? What does that tell any viewer? I mean, it doesn't matter how, how short-minded or show low intelligence a person has. If a person is called, if a program is called 60 minutes, it tells you something. This program lasts 60 minutes. Okay, and you know that, for example, Saturday Night Live lasts one hour and a half. Everybody knows that in the States. And you, for example, the, the Radio Rochella I used to work in did last, it was Mondays at 8 p.m. Mondays at 8 during 40 years in the Republic of Venezuela meant humor and laughter during one hour thanks to Radio Rochella. And that time, time slot was never changed. So one important thing is that you have a day in the week uh, and then uh, and, and, uh, the same day and the same time because people build habits. And for building habits, to, it's just like, for example, when you are taking an antibiotic inside the body, you know why it's important? Because the body internally functions like your brain in that sense. The medicine you're taking, if you take the medicine, the doctors pray and, and pledge you and, and they, they <laughs> what do you say when they ask you it's something important. on your it is like on a, the knees? It is like a brain muscle. The more you train it, the more it will uh, have a reflex of that kind. So having a particular day every week makes people excited for that when the time comes closer, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And good thing that you are interrupting now. Perfect, <laughs> exactly. That's it. So that the, in this case, what, what do you need is, is it's just like in the body, the antibiotics have to be taken exactly at the same time because, because you have an internal clock in your body and the internal clock has different chemical activities to do. The, the liver do some things and you know that and and if you get your body used and the doctor tells you okay you're going to take this pill during one month okay and when I'm going to take it please take it eight, eight, every eight hours okay let's do 11 p.m 7 a.m and 3 p.m and I put alarms all over my house or, or where I am because I want to be sure that I'm very, very on, on time and, and I take my 11 a.m. pill at 11 a.m., my 3 p.m. pill at 3 p.m. and so on, okay? That's good for, your, for building the habit, for, for making, and not only that, it, it causes a better result in the body. The same with the brain. If you get your people, your audience used that you are going to be talking about baseball or basketball every Thursday at 8 p.m. You in three weeks, in, in three after three weeks and after three Thursdays, you will be starting to get used to that and you won't be reminders and you will be just like, a, oh, that I, I love this basketball program. I, I want to go and see. It. Okay. So, and the other thing is graphically. I mean that you should inform the people in Twitter spaces how long a space is going to be. Yes. For example, sir, you I have, yeah. what I have seen is Twitter spaces is a thing that you can schedule and talk about it and do the advertisements. But with current time, the uh, attention span or everything is on demand. Now, even now, people don't wait for programs to come on TV. Everything is recorded. You can watch it at your convenient time. And or you, there is YouTube. You can see everything anytime. You missed it, no problem. You can see it whenever you want. So how do you think uh, the importance of time and scheduling and habit comes in with this kind of uh, what things we are getting used to these days? Because, because of the following. You have, for example, one of the virtues of the Twitter spaces is that they stop you scrolling. And scrolling is the most damaging thing for the brain in these times. I mean, yes. you are scrolling all day long. You are scrolling in Twitter. You are scrolling in Instagram. You are scrolling in Facebook, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Your life is 
slipping away between your fingers because of the scrolling, okay? Everybody's losing life, losing value, losing time. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, the uh, l- scrolling is just like the worst thing, in uh, the worst suffering in humankind communications nowadays. It looks like something useful, but scrolling is a malady. Scrolling is an illness. Scrolling is an enemy of the human race. Okay? And you they handle People, ahead, I have an amazing quote. People say that um, focus is the biggest competitive advantage. So if you can get focus of the audience and stop them to, from scrolling or in your personal life, if you can have focus and not reply to your notifications every day and allot some particular time slot for it, that becomes your competitive advantage. <laughs> yes, ex- exactly. So what the one thing good about Twitter spaces is that you stop scrolling and you sit just like where you are with some friends. We are here. We have a nice little group of six pe- or four people with us. Thank you for being here and staying and listening. And, and, and just like, a, okay, we are, we are nice. We are, we are okay because we are not scrolling, but, if you, if I am scrolling and I find a space that could interest me, I would like to know two things. Okay, they are going live because we we know future spaces are live. They if, if when they, I mean, you can see clearly whether when a space is live and where it's not. If if the whole rectangle is purple, you that are, they are going live, or it's an announcement for a live um, a upcoming uh, connection. See. Are you there? Yes. You can understand if it is live or it is a recorded version of past. Yeah, no, exactly. But you can, you can, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, what I mean is I would like to see just like a, when, when you get into a football, for example, a soccer game, there is a transmission of a soccer game in television. Okay. What happens in any television station in the world? You have the time in a little corner in the screen. You can see if they are in the half, in the first half or in the second half. And you can see, oh, this guy, oh my goodness, there's only 15 minutes of this game left unless there are penalties. Because you see this just like a second half and it's 30 minutes. And you know a half lasts 45 minutes. So that's what I want for Twitter spaces. I mean, tell me, how long is your space, okay? It can be half an hour only for prayer. It can be one hour. It can be one hour and a half. But why cannot we know in advance? Um, you know, I mean, Twitter spaces, because they, this is something that, that is too ego ridden. You know what I mean? For example, if you start suddenly in a space and you get people coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in, is something that we comedians call to uh, fall in love with the candy, with the candy bar, just like a kid. And we say, when you are doing good and you have the people laughing at almost anything, anything you say, don't get too long. I mean, leave them laughing. That's one of the mottos in the stand-up comedy industry. Uh, uh, okay? Yeah. Leave them laughing. Get down the stage when they are in the higher laughter, and they will say, "Like, no, no, why are you gonna? I mean, we're having such a good time. Yes. Why are you gonna leave right now? You have to leave them laughing because the next time they what the what the the the, the remembrance they will have about you will be, oh, Dan May, that this guy is so fucking good. I mean, they did laugh a lot. I remember because you will you will left with hunger." I wanted to see Monta- more Tan May and, and he when he left the stage. You know what I mean? Yes. So, even musicians do that. You know, they end on a high peak and then they want people to say one more, one more. And yes, I exactly. Kind of or they sure. prepare. They, pre- they prepare false endings. For example, mm-hmm. if they want to play, actually, they, even when you're selling a car, you are going to sell a, an automobile, a vehicle, and you really want... Uh, $2,000 for the car. What do you do? You ask 350, uh, uh, 3,500. Uh, 3, you really, really want 2,000. 
and you say no they can't ending it on a high note <laughs> Yeah, the people will will start, you know, asking for a lower price, and they say, oh, "Okay, I will leave it in three thousand only." Ah, oh, but three thousand is too much for me. Okay, the least the least I can do is three a two fifty two five hundred. Ah, oh, well, I don't know. And, and, and okay, my last my last offer two thousand, and he said, "Okay, okay, take take the two thousand. What did you do? Okay, that he is giving you what you wanted. Okay, so the the artist, the musician." He wants to. He was. He doesn't want to sing more than twenty-five songs. Okay, in his concert, he goes and says to the band, "Okay, we are gonna do a pretended finish in the song nineteen or in the twentieth song." Okay, and the, and you will go and go. Okay, thank you, Mumbai. Thank you. I was so happy to sing for you. And people, ah, another one. Ah, another one. Ah, another one. I don't know who the, in, in Spanish is. Otra, 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 another one, another one, another one. And then I leave. I pretend I'm leaving. People keep, stay there. People applaud. It's a fake scene. Everybody knows that the artist is going to be back. Okay? And that's the way. It's just like a way of ending. The, the, the concert uh, uh, never ends until the reprise ends how That's do you, the truth. how do you do this with jokes or how do you do it in a interview no in in it does a very very good question uh in the case of an interview uh you can it's different it's different because what it, i'm t- telling you if you're in a television station the interview lasts half an hour well you you know that you 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 have we you we use for example in my show when I had the comedy show, I had a clock, and and a digital clock just like in the Olympics, uh, with red numbers uh, over a black background, and I could see it was just like a, a clock. Um, how do you call it? a timer that was telling me it counted the numbers and the seconds back. You know, just like at twelve minutes, eleven minutes, eight minutes. So I could see. Besides one of the cameras, how long of that part of the program I still have? How many minutes? So I did prepare for the end. So in the case of an interview, it's difficult to do because I, you have two persons. I mean, it doesn't make sense to just like the guests cannot tell you, oh, I'm going to leave and then and going back. That just it doesn't fit that the idea there. And in but in a stand up comedy is pretty much like a musician. So you can do that if you wish. But it's not usual. It's not so usual in stand-up comedy. Usually, when you leave, you left. I mean, you you just try to to leave them actually with laughter. I think that musicians apply that more than any other form of art. And yes. What, so, yes, because in, in a stand-up comedy, it's not so, so usual. Now that I think of it. Yes, sir. Um, we are coming to the end of the segment, as you mentioned. Now we'll open the stage for the sh- questions from the audience. So anybody, if you want to come up and ask questions, do come ahead. I will accept the res- request and you can go ahead. And until you are coming up, I would ask, sir, sir, how did you get to know about NFTs? And have you minted any NFTs? And what do you like about no, it? Not yet. Not yet. I, I, I am just studying. I'm learning the terminology. Uh, well, this is not personal with terminology, which is here, but it's, <laughs> I, I'm going to follow him. Uh, terminology, that's a wonderful name for, a, for a, an account. Thank you for being here. But I, I, I'm getting used to NFTs terminology and NFTs um, glossary. Uh, the, the, the things about the smart contract are, are, are hard for me to understand. I, some people tell, I'm um, some, uh, uh tutorials tells you that one thing or uh, and, and in other tutorial they tell you another one so you know i'm just trying to i'm seeking the truth behind this there are things that i love and reconfort me a bit a, a lot better said uh, for example people like quincy jones who's still alive thank god this brilliant music magician who? working with with Michael, with with Michael Jackson, uh, Quincy Quincy Jones, the the Quincy producer, Jones. the musical pr- producer, and and he's working with some um, with the people of the Grammy Awards, okay, 
and the Grammy Awards are going to to throw uh, uh, an NFT collection for the 64, 65, and 66 uh, uh, Grammy Awards. They already said they will have collections music related and NFTs, um, um, music related NFTs. By, by issued officially by the Grammys Awards organization. It's just like the Academy. I don't know if the Oscars is already, are already into NFTs too, but I think it's going to explode. I think this is going to explode really if governments don't interfere. And I, and I have, you know, a little bit of technical trouble here, like at the beginning of the space, we had a little bit, and, and it's just like a, uh, there are several issues regarding the handling of the um, instrument, the tools, the economic tools. For example, uh, PayPal. I, I used to have PayPal many years, but then I couldn't verify my account again because the Venezuelan banks don't have the officially the dollar. So it's not, I mean, the dollar is everywhere in the street, but I cannot have dollars inside a credit card issued by a Venezuelan bank. So that's, well, there is some ways of doing it now, supposedly, but uh, yes, we, we certainly... That is the biggest advantage for folks in Latin America or Iran or China or countries with a lot of uh, restrictions on foreign exchange and especially on the US dollars. You can use cryptocurrencies which don't have any regulations, nobody to stop the flow that can you be used for exchanges. I think that's the reason why uh, it is very attractive for everyone. And secondly, sir, there are, you you have been a celebrated uh, TV host and comedian. You can mint, you can make NFTs out of the top memories or the top show or top joke you cracked or if you have any clip from that moment in the TV show or the radio, you can make the NFT of that and sell it to your fans. <laughs> That yeah, yeah, a exactly. I, I'm a, I'm actually working on that uh, seriously with two persons who are helping me, and I mean, and 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 let me tell you something. I saw your interest, and I saw that you have been already minting and selling and stuff, and I I, I am gonna be including you in the list of my counselors. Okay, so probably <laughs> after this, I'm going to be asking you some questions or 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 begging you for some recommendations that could help me to understand this a little Absolutely. bit more. I have been in the space more than a year now, and I think I'm pretty, uh, I have accumulated information, so I'll definitely be able to uh, guide you uh, with my experience. Okay, I, I, I really do hope so. Well, and regarding the, the I think I didn't finish to end to the, the question. You, you, you made the last question. And I wanted to say something extra uh, to round the answer I wanted to give you. Let me remember, you asked me about, ah, okay, how do how this musical thing that the musicians do of this pretending and false ending apply to stand-up and to, and to uh, the other thing? Okay, I will say, I wanted to say this. In a stand-up comedy, what we use is, is, is a wonderful trick that, for example, imagine that I am making a routine about cricket in India, okay? And I have in that bit, in that module, uh, that segment, it, is, it consists of 11 jokes about cricket, okay? And then I go to my second topic uh, for in my routine, which is who a whales, okay, and saving the whales, and how is the whale movement doing in the war, whatever. And my third topic is medicine, for example. While I am on the cricket subject, and I say my egg, uh, joke number seven, joke number eight, joke number nine, and I'm getting closer to the end, I stop at joke number nine, okay, if I have 11 jokes, and I pretend that I ended the cricket subject at that joke, okay? And then I go into the second, which is uh, medicine, for example, okay? And I start talking about medicine. Okay, cricket is, we finish with cricket, and I start talking. I go with my first joke in the medicine segment. I do my second joke. But then suddenly I pretend like an actor 
that I just came up with a couple of a, a, a couple of more extra cricket jokes that were created inside my brain in front of the audience. It's one like you see someone who is an artist, a cartoonist in the street, and you see the magic of a, of an art, of a cartoonist of a, someone who knows how to paint and how to draw. Isn't it great for you when you see the hand moving and you don't know where the hell is going and then you say, oh, look, that's the nose. Oh, it's a hand. Oh, he was painting the tree. And, and you see how the building, how the drawing builds in, in front of your eyes. I, there's people who love that magic. And you can pretend as a standard comedian that you are creating in front of them. Maybe I have done the cricket routine, did those 11 jokes more than three years. But every time I will pretend and the joke number nine that I ended, I will start with my next module. And then I will stop and I say, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about what I said about Tan May, the way Tan May plays cricket. And, and boom, I will throw the joke number 10 and then the joke number 11. And they will, they will go crazy. First, if they, in case the, good, the jokes are good. And second, because they feel like privilege, like they feel like they were in the, in the workshop of Picasso or, or the workshop of Salvador Dali, uh, just like, a, oh, I saw the master creating. You know what I mean? Yes. There is a, on the there is a, in fact, yeah, those, jokes, those jokes which are imprompt or which are created on stages, stage are, I find them more funny. Uh, where, where, where it's just happening live with the audience. So, Prepare. Yes. Yes. So and for, for, for example, one thing we teach in the comedy workshops is that you have to prepare the impromptus. There is no, I mean, that, that's a bit, what, what can happen inside a, this type of local? For example, if you're not in a theater, maybe a waiter, uh, just, uh, uh, how do you say, when you drop, uh, trap and you fell down to the floor uh, when you when you hit your leg or your foot with something and you fell down. Maybe yes. the waiter fell fell down with the with this thing in her hand with the bottles and everything. You can have pre rehearsed in your mind what to say if a waiter falls to the floor. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Hey. 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 See, keep keep drinking on hiding, keep drinking on hiding, get drunk early. That's what happens when you drink hiding from your boss. You know, for example, people will go crazy. You're like, oh, he's accusing the, the waiter of stalling the whiskey or something and drinking <laughs> hiding. And he got drunk and that's the reason he felt. Maybe, probably he was a drunk customer in a table who is put his leg to go to the bathroom and, and make the waiter trip and fall down. But I am accusing him so people will enjoy that. <laughs> or drinking. for example, what happens what happens is a lamp comes down from the from the ceiling. And, or if the light uh, there is a blackout of power and suddenly you are without energy in the microphone. You have to have a set of because you know what's important, Dan May. If you don't have the pre-prepared answer, there is a rule. I do this recommendation for in case you, any of you want to try stand-up someday. Remember this rule. This is a law of physics in a stand-up comedy. The faster, the better. Okay? It's better that you say anything in the first second after the event, after the unexpected event, that taking three or four or five seconds to think a better joke. But if mm -hmm. every second is like a day or a month in the mind of the people or the audience. Do you know what I mean? So yes. it's better that you see, if you don't have anything better, a better joke prepared and the waiter trips and falls down, it's enough that you instantly said, goal by mustache <laughs> of elephant. Because imagine that the waiter have a big mustache and you and you said a mustache and you said the elephant mustache made his goal. Now the game is two zero. Great, let's give him a hand. You yeah. know what I mean? So, so it doesn't practice, matter what you say. For an for, and doesn't matter what you say. Just be quick. No, be the be the fastest to say that. 
No, listen, for example, uh, I, I once I was presenting myself in a place where I, I was just like training comedians and I was the host of the, show, of the thing. And while I was doing my bit, uh, I was just like a lower engine in, 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 because I wanted the, the new comedians to shine. And suddenly a couple started this arguing and the woman hit the man hard, but really, really hard. And, and slap the man's face. And then again, he slapped him again. And the man stood, okay? He stood uh, holding the pain. He never touched his, his face. And the woman was about to go for the third one. And, you know, everybody was just looking at that table, okay? And you know what I did? I started narrating that like it was a boxing match. And I started, okay, okay, woman is hand in a second hand. And we're going to see, he said, uh, the Peter is totally paralyzed. Let's see the movement. He's coming away. He's going for the third. And no, but he's stopping her. And, you know, and then everybody started to love. And suddenly they realized that the whole set, the whole space in that local, in that, in that mm, commodity or facility where we were presenting ourselves, everybody had noticed and they become the center of attraction. And I was narrating everything he did. For example, if he touches, if he passes his hand he's through his hair, I said, okay, he's very worried. Look at him. He's passing the hat on his hair. He was, I was describing every movement they did. And that stopped the fight. They started to laugh. Okay. And I said, and now, now, they are kissing. They are kissing. <laughs> She's giving a kiss to him. And the woman, you know, she gave me a finger. And everybody that <laughs> house went down because I was just like okay. making the narration. Supposedly she had to follow my instructions. And when I said, oh, <laughs> and now she's kissing him passionately. And she looked at me and she gave me the strongest finger ever has given me. You know, just like, you are nuts. You know, I am hate this guy. I will never in my life will kiss him. And that was wonderful. But, you know, they said, and they kept sit. They never left, and and they ended at the, till the till the bed. Okay, and I instantly went to the waiter and said, "Please send them a bottle for staying." And I invite them mm-hmm. a bottle, and I purchase a bottle. I discharge it on my account, and, and they went. Okay, uh, the car Cecilia is sending you this, and uh, you know what I did? I said, "Hey, if you don't slap him again, I will sign that bottle for you." And they left her, <laughs> and they were just like. And then at the end, okay, okay, you promise you're not going to slap her, to slap him again? Okay, so I went, I interrupted one of the new comedians because they were about to leave. And I said, okay, come on, come on, come to the stage. So they went up to the stage. I went, okay, I won't pretend. I don't know your personal trouble. I guess she's very angry, but I want to really thank you for staying here. Okay, so let me put the, I, I, let's going to do something. And I ask it for a coin and I do something. I don't know why, because you haven't given us any clue about this, but I think that there is there is some a little, little, little probability that you won't stay together. So I won't sign this bottle naming both of you. Let's flip a coin and the winner name will be on the bottle only. So when you split and you divorce, you, uh, the way, I mean, the, the, the person with the name on the bottle, of course, will have to keep the bottle. We did that. <laughs> we, f- we flipped the coin and she was the winner. Okay. And I, and I signed the name. I guess she, her name was Susana in Spanish. And he went and he put, okay, Susana. And I put that in the name of, of her. Okay. You know what happened? Like four years later, in another place of Caracas, I found it in a in a mall, and they I, I heard Carlos, Carlos, and I heard a, a, a woman's voice and a and a man's voice he, he, screaming my name. They were there. They were still together. Okay, and you know what he said? You I we don't know what happened that night, but we really were decided to split, and then. I he he said like a joke. Oh, but we split. I will lose. We I, we I do. I won't have Carlos bottle here with the signature in my house because you will keep the bottle. So 
his day, it was like four or five years later. So what, what wow. we did, I said, okay, I have one idea to give you a second chance of divorce. Okay, let's get to this liquor store, purchase a bottle of the same liquor, and I will sign it for you. Okay, so you can leave away. And she started, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I don't want <laughs> to speak with him. Can you believe that a wonderful ending? And she didn't leave me. He didn't leave me to purchase the bottle and say, let's do that. Let's do that. But I was so happy that they had stayed because that was like their, their last time together. It was very, it was a horrible and very uncomfortable moment for all the audience and everybody. So that's what it called lubricant that's what it called being right. a lubricant in the engine of life and so we go around since we began oh, to the wow. first question i love the way and, i love the I, way you started with lubricant and you're concluding with this i think that's what a good uh come uh startup script is concluding with all the jokes together and coming together in the conclusion so exactly and, I, and, and this I, I swear to God that he was not prepared. I, and I suddenly realized exactly my acting, my in, intervention became a lubricant in that engine, in that friction that was on the table. And that was magic. That was the magic of humor working. And then it, it was really funny for me. It was incredible that I, I, I saw the woman so eagerly Asking me to not not purchase, don't purchase that bottle, don't purchase the bottle. Uh, it's just like everything changed between them, and now she was in love with him again, and he has forgiven him. And and she said, no, 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 don't do that. Just like it was going to be a bad luck thing or something, because you know the first bottle gave them luck. So she was, just, don't break the spell, <laughs> you know that no, attitude. Yeah. You're like, don't break don't the spell, be- don't break the spell. Yeah. So I, I I was very happy for them, and I I hope to that the next time I met them, uh, I think the coincidence possibilities are very little. I, maybe they are not even in Venezuela now. Who knows? And but if I find them again, I really would love to see them. And they, are you still together? You survived that <laughs> night going to the comedy thing. Oh my goodness, that's great! Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Now, Mr. Khalid has been waiting patiently to ask his question. Sir, could you please introduce oh, yourself? Yes, to yes, yes I have forgotten about that. Yes, go ahead. Open your, open yeah, your mic, Khalid. <laughs> open your mic, yes. Otra, otra, otra. Amigo, oh. Carlos. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. I like your uh, speech about lubrication of sense of humor that uh, we can face all our ch- challenges in our life, daily challenges. Uh, so I appreciate it, your talk. And appreciate it also the tip of uh, asking why. Yes, asking why is the key of uh, success of questioning. Uh, and many thoughts and many beautiful uh, thinking and a beautiful speech you did uh, give us, uh, dear Carlos. Carlos, my question is how... How the sense Before you of ask your humor... question, please, uh, Mr. Khalid, where are you from yes. and what do you do? Please, could you introduce yourself before asking the question? Yes, I, I am, I, I am uh, Khalid. I am from Jordan. I am working as an engineer in a clean energy. I am working in solar energy projects in Jordan. And our experience in Jordan is very advanced. We have rich experience in uh, renewable energy, especially in solar uh, energy. Wow. We're using sun. Uh, yes, we're using sun as a main source of power for hospitals, uh, uh, governments, build, buildings, governments, and some schools. So uh, even the private sector also, this is um, our project. Besides that, I have Hopi as a musician. I am doing Arabic music. One day I will play music here in your space. I hope so. <laughs> wow, yeah, okay. Okay. What instrument do you play? I am playing an Arabic instrument named Doud. I have in uh, my penny tweet, I am playing Oud and uh, many songs, but the Spanish songs uh, I have uh, in, in Russia, I finished in, uh, I finished engineering from United uh, uh, ex-Soviet Union and from Russia. I learned in Odessa for one year and six years in St. Petersburg. I finished marine engineer. I work as a marine engineer. I visit so many Mr. countries. Khalid, 
is from Jordan. He is into clean energy and uh, we are looking forward to him playing music in this space. Sir, what was the question which you wanted to ask? Okay. Um, I, my question is how, Carlos, how uh, the sense of humor became your brand, Carlos? How it's become because of your challenges, because of traveling from Caracas to another countries, how the sense of humor became your brand? What's the trigger? Okay. Uh, actually, I, it started, I, I will tell you the real, real, real truth about this. I could elaborate and create something that will sound more magical or you, when you embellish in my story, but I won't do that. I will tell you the sheer, tr the sheer truth is this. I started to read very, very early in my life. I, I was pretty intelligent for reading. I don't, I won't say I, I had been intelligent for many other areas of my life, not at all. But relating to reading, my intelligence helped me. I, I say, as Benjamin Franklin says, uh, the guy in the United States, the old, the old famous um, uh, hero in the United States, Benjamin Franklin said a, a quote, I ha there is a quote by him, that I totally embrace it for myself. He said, I don't remember not knowing how to read. I don't remember not, not being a, a reader. And that's the same for me. I, I guess I started reading like a one year old, one year and a half. Something. And my father, my late father, he died like 15 years ago, uh, uh, being 85 years old. He was subscribed to the Reader's Digest magazine. And the Reader's Digest magazine, as you may know, uh, has the serious articles or longer articles. But between articles, at the end of the page, there are these little jokes. There are little jokes at the end of the articles and a whole section devoted to humor. It's like laughter, the bad medicine, life in this United States, all in a day's work, a, a student a student scene or something like that. And, and they have plenty of humor in the magazine. So I started to read and, and, and while reading, I discovered the structure of jokes reading for a reader's diet. That was just like my first humor textbook. And then I started to choose to just like became like an editor inside my mind because I started to mark the magazines and my mother and my sister got angry at me because I used a pen and, and I was actually writing on the magazine. Hey, well, don't write on the magazine. And I was just making check marks for the good jokes and for the bad jokes. Okay, because when I take the magazine again, I didn't, I, 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 for example, if a visit, someone come to visit or I took the magazine to the school or something, I wanted to know where the hell in that issue were the good jokes. So all the, I, I still have those magazines 50 years ago. I, we, I, I still conserve them. And you can see my hand re, re, my handwriting like a kid of six year old, seven year old. Oh, just like being a humor authority, choosing which joke, jokes were funnier or were. Imagine that pretense. But that started there. And the second, the second thing that was real magic and is regarding, re, related to my father, is that my father did, did he was creative with humor, he was very funny. He did a prank on us that I did love that he was, for example, we wanted to go to a park called in Caracas. It's a beautiful park, like Central Park in New York, but bigger. And it's like a special, uh, it's a kind of zoo. It has some animals, but they are not in cages. They are in, 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 in closed facilities, but not, not, it's, it's not so uh, just like the old uh, style of uh, zoos which are very painful for the animals. And, and then, for example, if we wanted to go to this parque, to the Parque del Este, uh, and, oh, we are expecting, oh, it's Wednesday. Or then came, hey, oh, we are going on Saturday to the park. And my two sisters, I have two younger sisters, we were the three of us, oh, expecting, expecting you to go to the park. Uh, this is the kind of humor of my father. My late father, he took the, uh, the newspaper and he started reading aloud. And then 
he did this on Friday night at 10 p.m., for example, or 9 p.m., when we were about to go to, to, to sleep, uh, totally excited because we were going to go to the park next day. And he said, okay, uh, the government said that the oil prices, so and so and so. Uh, there was an accident in that avenue, so and so and so. Oh, look here. Uh, Parque del Este will be closed tomorrow. Oh, why? Uh, here, authorities said that tomorrow, Saturday, and we believe him. He, he was just making the shit up, you know, so just to see, to scare us. It was just like a, a April Fool's joke, a practical joke, a practical prank. And we fall for it because he was such an, a good actor. And he was, oh, my goodness, no. Uh, we never thought that he was kidding us. What we thought is, oh, what bad luck. They are closing tomorrow because we never. So he was such a good actor. He was uh, that, but he was a serious, he lived a serious life, you know. And see what he was somehow. Uh, when people didn't know him well, so he was watching the news, and you couldn't bother him, okay? And my mother said, "Don't bother do that. Don't bother do that." So we were watching the news, and one, I, uh, my little sister, liked to make to tickle him, to make him, to make him laugh, touching him, actually tickling him under the arm or in the belly. You know, you like the little girl with his daddy, but he was actually touching him. And it's, I was, I am very ticklish and I hate people tickling me, but I really hate it. I don't like people tickling me. And then I saw my sister and I said, ah, oh, she's bothering my dad. And then one, one day I said a joke. I read a joke from the magazine to my father and my father laughed aloud. And for me, it was like a discovery. And uh, an epiphany moment, because for me it was like I had discovered control remote remote control laughter. You know what I mean? I mean I made my father laugh without touching him. I was way better than my sister. I have a superpower. You know I don't need to tickle him. <laughs> I can use wow. it. when when my mind wow. when my mind discovered. The, the fact that I could make him laugh using words without touching him, that that's the moment I did marry with the concept of humor, the power of humor, and I said, I will devote my life to this. Maybe I didn't do it consciously. I was maybe six years old only or seven or whatever. It's very, very little kid compared to now. But I, I know that that moment was such a, a turning point for me because I started reading more things. Everything was humor. I started drawing little cartoons and everything was related. It was like I, I was born with this humor vein. But I wanted to study. I didn't want to be just like just the clown of the class. I wanted to know why the jokes worked. I wanted to know my sister laughed. At, that, at this show better than at this other. And then I decided something. I didn't want to be the biggest one. I didn't be, want to become the greatest. Maybe some, I, I, I'm really afraid that somehow, because I feel that God did gave me like a prize, a lot of talents that had been ah, long in use or used very low in their compared to their potential, but I decided to not complicate my life. You know, I I love the simple life that my father lived. He didn't. He, he was a simple man in in his customs, in in the way of raising us. The, he was not thrifty. He was not cheap. But he was practical. He was prevent. I mean, he he for example was going to a place. And he did a phone call before going just to check up that they were there, not to lose the trip. And many times my, my mother would say to him, but why are you calling the doctor again? You, you just talked two hours ago. And my father would say to her, in two hours, many things can happen. Well, you know what happened one day? Do you want to know what happened one day? We were going to see a cardiologist because my mom had been having just like something in the heart. And 
uh, we called the doctor two hours before. The last call was two hours before. And they said, come here at 2 p.m. Or, for example, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. And then we headed to the doctor. You know what happened? The cardiologist died at noon of a heart attack. Okay? If my mom will, ha will have let my father call half an hour before going, we have got the news. And we have, I mean, we, we, we have, have saved the, the trip to the clinic, which was pretty far away. You know what I mean? So that marked me forever. Just like, a, be precautious. I mean, I am, uh, you know, just for example, uh, when I, I, I was able to see Placido Domingo singing in Venezuela, well, you know what I did? I take my car. I took my car. I went early in the morning. I parked the car inside the theater. I came back home in a taxi. I will pick up my girlfriend in a taxi. We stopped in the theater. And then I was happy because that was totally crowded. Uh, getting out of the theater parking lot will took one hour or two hours, it's and my car way. was the first one cl close to the door, to the exit door. Okay, so that's what I learned from my father, and that may, it was just like a, a cavalry scene that was great because I was tranquil because I knew I wasn't going to be trapped in that in that building too long, you know, that kind of thinking. So that's the reason. Mainly, I discovered that my father, I mean, when I saw my father laughing from far away without need of touching him, that changed my life. That was it. And the first stage, of course, of getting to know actual humor through the jokes in the Reader's Digest uh, book, uh, Reader's Digest magazines. Wow, that's incredible. You started, you, you got inspired from your father. And you oh, found yeah. your calling very early on. Uh, that's that's a gift to for many people, sir. Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for coming in. Uh, he Mr. discovered Marie. himself. I, I won't jump this. He discovers Carlos discovered himself during now. He, this story is very inspiring and touchy, and uh, this great re really I enjoy hearing his story about his father. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Mr. Okay, okay. for sharing. I have one question uh, for you, Mr. Carlos. Uh, like the way Kapil Sharma, a famous comedian in Ask, Ask in India. Mr. Carlos Zilia, you have been a comedian, host, script writer. You have been on the number one show of Venus Villa, the radio, Cochetta. You have been David Letterman style. You have started the whole show um, in, in Spanish, in comedy TV, after so much experience and after having so much fame, how do you feel like coming to Rock Class Radio and do a podcast with me? <laughs> uh, no, no. Listen, listen. L let me tell you something. There is one ingredient, okay, that I, uh, I mean, when you feel... Something like I felt today, and I felt these days we, uh, since you invited me, is something that you know that it is there or it is not there. What it is? A true interest, okay? It's, it's like a, when you feel a true interest. So if, if you are a painter and someone uh, gets close to you and shows strong and real and honest interest in what you're doing, that's the best and the most flattering thing that you can feel, okay? So imagine for me, I live in South America. I was fortunate enough to visit uh, Mr. Khalid country, Jordan, the, the, the reign of Jordan, or the Jordan kingdom, sorry, and, 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 and uh, also Israel. I went to Machu Picchu in Peru. I went to Chile. I went to, uh, I lived one year in Los Angeles. But you know what? It's just like a one in life. I'm, I was going, listen, you are in Mumbai. You are in India. You are an actual indie person, Hindu person. I mean, you are living there. That, I mean, imagine the distance historically in kilometers, in religion, in lifestyles. Imagine, I mean, for me, this is an Oscar award. Okay, <laughs> you can... I, 
I this I feel like I'm receiving an Oscar. I mean, how how the magic worked through Twitter Spaces to make you? I mean, I I am really I'm not gonna lie to you. I have a, a, a something in my throat. How do you say? Just like a, a I'm really feeling emotional with here because that's the reality for me. Okay, I can be. I maybe I, I was known in my country, but I am still alive. I am still on this planet, and and India has existed long before Venezuela as a country. You have inf- influenced the, this planet so much with your culture and 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 do, doing a little job. You with your religions, with your influence, you influence uh, is in so many ways, in so many because you are a country with personality it's like this let's put it like this imagine that the planet is a, is a cocktail it's a cocktail meeting oh there is a cocktail let's meet at, it's going to be at 7 p.m we have three drinks oh and you get less a gathering of people what happened in a cocktail you will see persons that are like gray persons okay in a corner and then you will see in another corner brilliant person two or three of them we, which are lively, we have like a strong personality, we will have people around surrounding them, you know? It doesn't matter how they are dressed, it's just the, the personality, that they, 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 they are characters, you know what I mean? In the planet, there are people like, for example, which are for me the character countries, just like uh, with a strong personality of their own. India is one. Spain, of course, is one. Italy is another one. Who, who doesn't know Italy in this planet? The Mexicans, Mexican music, okay? They are just like a Mexican, just like a continent in themselves. And the same happens with Chinese people, also Japanese, being also Asians, like uh, Chinese or other or Koreans. They have a strong identity. Okay, so you are you belong to a country which is first of all huge, enormous in the extension. I don't know the exact kilometer surface, but you are really, really one of the biggest. I know that for sure. So for me, that you living in Mumbai, I know that one. I I I, so just a second. I knew for many years that your city was called. Uh, we call your city Bombay, Bombay. I was calling your city in forty-five years Bombay, and I know I, I I know it was changed recently. And Mumbai is the same Bombay of my childhood. Okay, so for me, you are a person of my the old dear Bombay that I read so many times in so many novels. I saw in James Bond. I saw in maybe uh, you know reading and. It's this is an emotional and an important moment in my life. I mean that this connection is blessed by God, is blessed by the universe. It's a, it's something incredible. You know what I mean? So what I enjoy of this is this tie, this 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 uh, link that goes so strongly across such a huge and far away distance because Caracas and Mumbai are really, really far away one from each other, okay? So yes. how is this miracle happening? I don't have words and I don't have money. I don't have anything. How to thank you for letting <laughs> this miracle happening in my life? Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I can only say that uh, you have been too kind. I almost feel like I've been put on pedestal. Yes, distance is a lot. If I drill a hole on earth from India, I'll come out from the opposite end in Venezuela. That is, we are opposite. We are on the opposite face of Earth. <laughs> That's how far the distance is. And I love the way you talked about India. It's a flavor. We have a lot of flavor and spices in our food. And as you mentioned, we are a character or a strong flavor in the cocktail or in the room as a character. <laughs> that was a very original statement and compliment I've heard about India. So thank you. And it is really an honor for me personally to uh, speak to person like you of course from a person from a la- person in latin america but more than that somebody who's as experienced as you uh, in in comedic fields and 
that that moment when you gave me that great response on that question of anxiety to me i knew i had to have a conversation with you i was just feeling a little nervous to ask when to ask him a person like you but you are so kind and courteous to come agree to come on the show so i'm very thankful for that <laughs> and uh, uh, i'm i will learn some spanish and soon come to venezuela i have i dearly invite you to come to india be a guest at my home and there are a lot of things to explore here so let me know when you plan to come <laughs> just tell us good good day and good weekend in uh, spanish okay bueno muchísimas gracias buenas noches is good night buenos días is good morning so buenas noches or, bu or buenos días according to where you are and thank you for this big honor tan me big honor for me thank you very much gracias Thanks for tuning in. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram to get updates on the new shows and to participate on live recordings. All links are mentioned in the show notes. We will be back next week with another fantastic episode.